but it's just simply beyond controversy that these uh, egregious expressions of white supremacy, um, including slavery and Jim Crow and all the rest, could not have persisted um, apart from the church's support of it. Welcome to Praise Hands, home of the Praise Hands, where we are all about creative cross-cultural Christianity. I'm your host, Robbie Valderrama. Today's guests are Duke Kwan and Gregory Thompson, the authors of the brand new book, Reparations, A Christian Call for Repentance and Repair, which makes a historical and theological case for the church's obligation to provide reparations for the oppression of African Americans. As many of our listeners know, when my wife and I moved to Nashville in 2015, we realized we were leaving one of the least church areas in the country and going to one of the most. But we didn't realize we were leaving one of the least racially segregated areas and going to one of the most. And as a biracial Christian, this left me out of tension. Duke, when I heard you talk at the Q conference, it made me realize that however much progress we think we've made as a church, whatever it is we believe is our mission, we're not going to get there without addressing this issue. Gregory, I've loved following your work as well. It seems like you're always at the forefront of some creative cross-cultural project, and I was thrilled to hear that the two of you guys were working on this book together. As I was thinking about this episode, this image came to mind of like a bomb going off in a war zone. And when that happens, you've got to dig up the rubble to find survivors. In some ways, it feels like over the past 400 years, there's been layer after layer piled on top of the truth of how our nation was built. And in order to write this book, you two had to peel back 400 years and more of rubble to find the truth. And as such, this might be the most overdue and desperately needed book written in the history of the American church. So I want to honor the two of you for this act of service to Jesus, to the church, and specifically to our African-American brothers and sisters. It's a deep honor to have you both on the show. Thanks for having us, Robbie. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So as, as we kick off, I think there's a lot of things we'll, we'll agree on. Duke, there's one thing we may not agree on, and that's that I'm a Warriors fan. So, um, you yeah, know, you we might have to pray through that, do some deliverance sessions or something, but... Um, but all, all that said, I think we can still be friends. Well, as uh, long as you send stuff over our way eventually, then, then, then we can be friends. <laughs> it's Fair gonna enough. happen. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, so, so you guys, in, in the beginning of your book, you went to great lengths to define exactly what you meant by a few key terms. And in turn, that provides some really helpful conceptual framework for your book. And, and I want to drill into this because I think it's important to start here. What are the four types or levels of, of racism that you talk about? What is white supremacy and what are reparations? Well, I'll start with the four levels, uh, four, four different ways of understanding racism, um, all of which in our view have true things to say. One of them is, is racism as personal prejudice, the idea that it's primarily a, disp a prejudicial disposition of the heart whose remedy is repentance. Um, another is that is racism as relational estrangement um, and whose primary remedy is racial reconciliation. A third way of, of understanding racism is primarily in terms of institutional injustice, um, the remedy for which is institutional reform. And then the fourth, which we propose and then elaborate um, in chapters two and three is racism as a cultural disorder, that it's an entire uh, system, a cultural system um, whose remedy can only be repair. Uh, so that, that's, that, that's how we talk about racism. And it's important, again, to understand that it's all of those things. But our concern is that, the, that many folks, especially many Christian folks, tend to focus on the first three and not really address the fourth, which is why we have yet one of the reasons why we've yet to have serious conversations and, and much of the American Christian church about reparations. So I'll, I'll do those. Duke, I don't know if you want to pick up any of the others or if you want me to keep um, going or whatever. White, white supremacy, then, is how we describe um, and, and characterize racism as we find it here uh, in the United States, so not only the United States, but globally as well. Uh, but by that, what we mean and what we mean to distinguish is that we're not just talking about racism uh, generically, uh, but rather uh, that this cultural disorder and this cultural system uh, that Greg just described, it was designed in the past deliberately to provide social advantages to people that are designated white. Of course, in the book, we also uh, go through the exercise of historically describing how whiteness came to be. 
um, that it is not actually a physiological, biological marker description of human beings, but rather it's a social designation uh, that actually lumps together people of all different kinds of ethnic backgrounds and promotes them to the top of the social ladder, as it were. Um, a, a hierarchy, a cultural hierarchy has been created that advantages people that are designated white and disadvantages or even punishes those who are non-white and especially African-Americans, historically speaking. That, that system of white supremacy was created deliberately in the past, but it endures even to the present, it, which is also part of the argument of chapter two, but it functions even without and apart from the personal will of its participants, right? So it, it is uh, something that it continues to do its thing in excluding, marginalizing, disempowering, and subjugating um, whether or not uh, American individuals intend for it to do so because it is embedded into our social systems. It is embedded into the culture, to the culture and the social order um, found in America. Now, I, I also want to talk about the definition of reparations, but before I move on to that, would you say theologically, would it be fair to call white supremacy a principality? I think so. I mean, I, you know, principality in, in scripture has this um, spiritual dimension to it that I think is is right and true. I mean, it, I think the the biblical category that I like to use as sort of the backdrop to this idea of white supremacy as a cultural disorder is the way the Bible talks about the world. Um, it's a very broad and some might say nebulous concept that the world is seen as being embodied in personal behaviors, but also embodied in institutions, even churches. The world is found in an individual's heart and it's found infecting all of society. And indeed the, uh, the prince of darkness himself is seen as the ruler of that world. So there is a, uh, certainly a, a spiritual dimension to all of this. That's a mystery of course, but I, I think the stronghold uh, that white supremacy has had on this country, it'd be hard from a Christian perspective to account for that without saying that there's, there's certainly unseen forces that continue to keep this nation in bondage. Absolutely. So let's talk about this word reparations. When you say reparations, what do you mean and what do you not mean? Well, in order to, I think, to answer that, we need to first state that uh, not only that white supremacy exists, but that its fundamental effect has been that of theft. Um, and we go at lengths to describe what we mean by that, but primarily the theft, we say, of truth, power, and wealth from African-American communities. Given that, reparations is simply the returning of those things which have been stolen in truth, wealth, and power through the, what we call the Christian ethic of restitution for those who are culpable and the Christian ethic of restoration, which is modeled in the Good Samaritan, for folks who may not be directly culpable or complicit, but nonetheless are called to, to do this work. So I think one of, one of the distinctive things that we mean, uh, or that we think we bring to the reparations conversation is that we broaden it beyond the monetary. Um, it certainly includes the monetary and that we broaden its moral logic to not just restitution from the culpable, but restoration from those who in Christian love are called, which is to say the church. And we set it against the backdrop, not merely of enslavement, although that is certainly a fundamental touchstone, but against the, the larger movement of white supremacy itself, of which slavery enslavement was a, was a major and mo perhaps most egregious example. And we also set it against the backdrop of local communities rather than, say, against the backdrop of the federal government. So it's typically talked about as in purely economic and statist terms. We want to be clear that we agree with the economics and that we also believe that the state has a role to play, but we think it's actually a much broader conversation that needs to be embedded in local communities and needs to express itself in, in, in a more multifaceted way. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I think one of the new pieces of conversation that really I've heard for the first time in your talk, Duke, at that Q conference was the church's specific complicity and therefore responsibility to do something about this issue. And, and the quote that I remember you saying was that the church signed the moral permission slip for society to enslave. Can you unpack this for us? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the church, of course, had a, an even more central social role um, in American society in past centuries than it does today. It still wields enormous influence even today, but it's just simply beyond controversy that these uh, egregious 
expressions of white supremacy, um, including slavery and Jim Crow and all the rest, could not have persisted um, apart from the church's support of it. Not only its passivity in terms of allowing these things to be, um, whether if that's uh, turning a blind eye to members within its churches that own slaves or ministers that provided the moral justification for slavery in, its, in their pulpits, but beyond that passive role, actually an active role that the church played in um, perpetuating white supremacy in advancing it. And even, uh, for example, in owning slaves institutionally and embodying the worst forms of white supremacy. So the church certainly is culpable and responsible. And that is why we uh, argue that sure that the state has a, a role to play the government uh, played a significant role, but the church did as well. And therefore the church has a responsibility to clean it up and to repair. Yeah, we, we sometimes want the institutional power, but not the institutional responsibility, you know, when it comes to the church. So I, I appreciate you shining some light on that. And one of the things that I want to talk through is in this conversation about reparation, like theologically speaking, I know that as Christ followers, it's important for us to be wary both of like a spiritual escapism that might ignore pain on one side and maybe a social idealism that ignores sin on the other side. And in my experience, evangelicals tend to lean towards the former in kind of the, Hey, you know, the world's all going to burn anyways. Let's, let's and I'm making a, a big generalization here, but if, if they had to lean towards one side, it might be that and, and progressive might lean towards the latter and in like, let's do good, let's do good, but maybe not focusing on some of the root issues at the, at the heart level. So my question is this, eschatologically speaking, when we're looking towards the future, what role do our good works play in God's plan to renew all things? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, and I want, I want to say that one of the critical things to understand in my view, and I would be interested to hear what Duke thinks about this because we haven't talked about this a lot, is to locate the, the reparations conversation in the realm of ethics, the theological realm of ethics, rather than in the theological realm of eschatology. And the reason for that is that places an undue burden on being able to draw what Leslie Newbigin calls a straight line between our works here and the kingdom come. I mean, he says there is no, there is no straight line. That said, well, so first, just to kind of full stop, we want Christians to think about this in terms of the, the moral obligations of the first and second great commandment and not get caught up in other sorts of conversations about what is the relationship of our reparative work now to some millennia of, of some sort, you know? And the reason I say that is because we, we see that happening in a review that just came out yesterday that made questions about eschatology. Um, but in our, in my judgment, as we'll say in our response to that review, completely ignored <laughs> what the actual conversation is about, which is about the realm of ethics right now. That said, I mean, I'm coming from, from an eschatological perspective that every good thing that is done now, everything offered in love, every glass of cold water offered in Christ's name will, as Leslie Newbigin again says, will be raised up on that last day and shown to be a part of the coming of the kingdom of God. And the, and the consolation of that is that that means that nothing is wasted. No act of love, no act of service is wasted. And so on the one hand, I don't want to overburden the reparations conversation by reframing it as a conversation about eschatology and the efficacy of human action and bringing the kingdom of God, because I think that there's a ton of mystery there. And I also think that that obscures a lot of the very straightforward, transparently clear things that we are saying on, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that we want to encourage the church by saying that because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrected reality of Jesus, the things that we do now offered in love will, by Jesus's own words, be honored and shown to, to be service to him um, and will take their place rightly in that shining kingdom. And I think that I want to hold both of those things together. Yeah, I, I agree with everything, everything that Greg just said. And, and, and just to add to that, or to put it, maybe locate it within the context of some um, criticisms that certain thinkers have of reparations is sort of identifying it as a new religion. And so a lot of Christians <laughs> therefore want to cast this as, well, 
creation, fall, redemption, consummation, reparations is trying to replace these categories um, in an unbiblical and anti-Christian sort of way. And that's just simply not the case. I mean, all we're really talking about is what, again, Newbegin referred to as, as the church being the sign and foretaste of the coming kingdom. I mean, we, we are not establishing some new morality that is uh, basically an over-realized understanding of heaven on earth. And it's love of neighbor. I mean, for goodness sakes, can we love our neighbor? <laughs> it really boils <laughs> down to that, which is what we talk about uh, in the sixth chapter of the book. And so everything that applies to the third use of the law and the importance the mandate of neighbor love in every other area of, uh, of the Christian life, it, it essentially boils down to that. There's a simplicity there, I think, which is what Greg is saying. There's a simplicity that we want to hold on to. Right. Uh, and it's, it's not us, but I think rather our interlocutors and, and critics that are trying to make this into a bigger religious uh, mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. construct than we mm -hmm. really intend it to be. I think that is really crucial to understand. This is being recharacterized re as some sort of expression of like a progressive idealist impulse. And I think that that is manifestly absurd because not only is it a poor reading of what, we're do what we've actually said, it is also an expression of a consistent, almost like intellectual tick in our larger evangelical tradition to when we are talking about racial issues to almost... Um, almost habitually overly complexify the issues uh, as a strategy of avoidance of their obligation. And I think that we really want to want to push against that and intend to do so in writing. No, that's so good. I, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to speak to that because I know I know that's a really important part of the dialogue that's going on right now. If, if I was, you know, one of those guys at the ice skating rink in the Olympics, I would give you guys like a 10 out of 10 um, for, for that response. <laughs> that is so important to articulate. And I just want to applaud you guys for graciously handling those conversations. Cause I know that, you know, those conversations can, can be difficult sometimes. So thank you guys for, for handling that with such grace. Do I want to ask a question for you. You're a pastor in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. Yeah. So as these issues come up where we can't ignore them and we don't want to ignore them, what's your approach? Cause I know there's going to be pastors listening to this episode. What is your approach to balancing the political and the pastoral aspects of not only racial justice, but a lot of these conversations in your congregation? First of all, I'd, I'd want to say that we approach and speak about reparations in our church as a moral issue, not primarily a political one. And I want to be careful about creating a, a sort of an, a, a, a false divide between the moral and political, but I think you know what I mean as far mm -hmm. as the way that we discuss it. Uh, we labor hard not to make it a partisan thing and try to illustrate from scripture. So for example, I preached on reparations last year, February of 2020, and I did it from the book of Luke, right? Chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus, um, with reference to Old Testament uh, passages as well, Leviticus and Numbers. So we're committed to making sure that these are conversations grounded in our scriptural tradition as, as Christians. But more broadly, which I think maybe is what your question is getting at, we want to handle these things with care because we want to be a community that is, maybe one way to say it is, inclusive of people of different political persuasions. And we believe that it's not wrong for the church to address, quote unquote, political matters, uh, politics often simply being love manifested in public, right? Uh, this is, again, different ways that we corporately love our neighbor institutionally uh, in terms of public policy and otherwise um, in the civic realm. So we talk about these things, but I, I think it's important to clarify though, that when we say we wanna be inclusive and nonpartisan, what we're not saying though, is that we won't shy away from saying certain things that are on the heart of God will appear to the uh, watching world to be partisan because they're more traditionally located uh, on one platform over against another, the gospel will lead us to take sides oftentimes uh, to advocate for certain positions or even policies that might be a better expression of the kingdom of God that might appear, again, appear to be partisan, um, but actually is simply because of the way that the world has sort of uh, crisscrossed these issues and decided to put them in one camp or another. In other words, uh, I, I just want to be clear that a, a church being biblically faithful uh, does not need to be centrist 
or wholly nonpartisan in every way, shape, and form on every issue. That makes it confusing and difficult and challenging to pastor people through, but I think that's actually what faithfulness ought to look like. Yeah, no, that's so good. And I think to your point about the local need for things like reparations and for the church to take a, a role in this, if we are able to function as a family and navigate through these things together and keep the bond of unity, mm. that enables us to have the relationships to be able to build as opposed to being separated from one another and being left really without any relationships to do what we're actually called to do as a church. And so I appreciate you speaking to that. Greg, for you, I mentioned to you guys before we hopped on that this show examines the American intersection of church, race, music, and economics. And, and I know you've been involved with all kinds of musical and artistic projects. And in many ways, and, and you could tell me whether you agree with this or not, but my perspective is that the sound of Christian music, what we call Christian music, has oftentimes been defined by the rejection of Black experiences. And my question for you is this, how would you see and how would you like to see Christian worship leaders and musicians using their repentant imagination? That's a great question. Um, I'm still processing what what you mean by the, you know, the sound being a rejection of black experiences. Um, I don't yeah. I don't know what I, I don't know that I fully understand that, but I, I could answer the, the second sure. part. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I, I will probably do it by just by way of example. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Porter's Gate. Mm -hmm. or with urban yeah. doxology, mm -hmm. yeah. Joel Littlepage at, at Grace Mosaic. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like one of the things that, it, that I see happening that is, that is important in my view, and again, I want to just say to your listeners, I am not in any way a, a scholar of, nor in any way a cultural gatekeeper of. I am a follower of mm -hmm. these musical trends. But I do think that there's a musical analogy to what Duke and I have done. And I'll, I'll try to explain it this way. Duke and I have spent the past 10 plus years, 20 years, really submerged in various forms of the African-American intellectual, literary, theological tradition uh, and, and artistic tradition. And I think that what I would want is for worship leaders, people who are responsible, that is to say, people who are responsible for shaping and enacting the liturgical life of the church to recognize that there's a whole tradition out there that needs to be addressed and spoken to and also embodied and brought into the life of our churches. Now we, we have to talk about that raises issues of appropriation and all these kind of other complicated things. But I do think that simply learning that African-American, in this case, African-American liturgical life has had a different repertoire than what we have in, in many white churches, different so, sort of emotional and semantic and sonic range is like really important. Mm -hmm. And then figuring out how to apprentice ourselves to those, to those things, to let them shape us, mm -hmm. change who we are, and then see those changes express themselves in liturgical life. I actually think that that, that for me has been a fundamental work. I know it has been for Duke. And I think people who, who are called worship leaders or who function in the leadership of liturgies as an, as a matter of fidelity need to, to learn to apprentice themselves to this larger tradition. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think there's so much to be said for asking, you know, who is, who's being honored in the way that we do church. And I think so many times in what I, what I was getting at by the, the sound of Christian music being defined by the rejection of black experiences I mean, classic example that you have is Kirk Franklin at the Dove Awards multiple times bringing up social issues and that getting censored from the, the final cut. I remember uh, Cornell West, I think it was, talking about you know, the blue note, which is this, this dissonant note that's formational to blues music. And that being a representation in musical form of the dissonance of the Black American experience. And so many times the same ways that we exclude conversations of color I think that a manifestation of that is that those extra notes, those as a music, musical people would understand the, the accidentals in our, our musical scales, those extra you know, tertiary things that are not quote unquote necessary to the basic normative notes in a scale are rejected because the dissonance causes something that really makes us uncomfortable at times. And when I look at what Christian music evaluates as normative, 
it's oftentimes the things that are not going to rock the boat. It's the things that are going to take our emotions and give us songs that are emotionally neutral. And I think when we're able to get past that and acknowledge in musical form what we see happening in real life, that can be a more holistic embodiment of the relationship that we say we actually want with other communities. Yeah, I, I, well, I absolutely do think that that's true, that there's a limited emotional range inside of what would be kind of popular worship music. And I'm making like generalizations sure. here, but I think that we people see this and people like John Whitley at the Calvin Institute for Christian worship and, mm-hmm. and Jeremy Begbie at Duke, you know, mm-hmm. Duke Divinity School and, and other folks have been pointing this out for a long time, that there's, there needs to be a broadening of emotional range. And I, I certainly think that that's true. And I think that giving attention to these other traditions, not simply because they're African-American, although I do think that's important, but also because they tell us true things and, and teach us how to live in a new kind of way that feels really critical. And that's why I brought up the examples at the beginning, like the Porter's Gate and things like that, because I do think that, you know, what Isaac Wardell is doing is, you know, with their album song, you know, Justice Songs and Lament Songs, mm-hmm. they're, they're trying to create and model and collaboratively embody this, this new emotional range, which yeah. is really an old one. Yeah, absolutely. So beautiful. Well, guys, I, I've, I've gotten through a lot of the, the heavy, heavy questions. I want to ask you guys maybe about your relationship and how this collaboration has looked for you guys. I know, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, this was not a project that was easy. I'm sure this was not something that came without a cost for you guys. Can you share just what this experience has been like for, for the two of you? both individually as well as working together to create this work of art and restoration. It's a complete nightmare, man. (laughs) (laughs) No, it, it, I mean, it's been thrilling. I mean, it genuinely is a joy to try to put words to these convictions and then to do it in partnership with a dear brother, you know, and all, and also I've appreciated the remarkable degree of resonance that our convictions I think have found um, not only found in terms of fa- finding their way onto the page, but even behind the scenes and things that we care about, you know, granted, we, we, we do have a lot of similar influences, you know, culturally and theologically mm-hmm. and otherwise, but even on the topic of reparations, there's a, there's a wide range of ways to approach the topic and angles to the, that uh, ways of reading history and all the rest. And, and I've just been grateful. Maybe it's just God's providence, but grateful for Greg's, partnership in this, but also say in terms of the overall experience, it's been hard too. I mean, it, you know, we've been going through this and finishing up the book in the middle of the pandemic. And that means with kids formerly at school, all being at home and trying to navigate, you know, virtual school life and, you yeah. know, everything, everything in life being turned upside down and, and, and stuff. And so in some ways, my wife and I are still recovering from that final stretch of finishing up the book and yeah, uh, that was hard, real hard. And in some ways, not the best of conditions for creative thought and writing and, and all the rest. And so I'm just grateful. I feel the Lord just gave us what we needed to finish it. And it is what it is. And, and yeah, uh, thankful for that. So a joy and a, and a hardship too, both of it. From my, in my perspective, um, Duke and I didn't really know each other very well. When we started this, we met several times and been together and been in like in the same circles. But this this really was a partnership born of conviction. It wasn't like a couple of bros sitting around, you know, having a drink and going, dude, we should write a book. It was more <laughs> like I'm thinking about these issues. You know, my doctoral work was was in this space. And then I heard Duke's talk at Q, the one you referred to earlier. And I actually texted him during that mm-hmm. talk while I was sitting in the audience and said, I think we need to write a book on this together. And I think it wasn't long before we actually had a, uh, a contract and a proposal and, and done and a contract done. And then we, we sort of spent a year thinking about it, reading about it in the midst of our lives. And I would say it's important that people know that this book was largely written during the pandemic. Not all of it, but I would say, I don't know, Duke, what do you think? 80% of it was probably written during that 80, time. Yeah, 75, and, yeah. And Duke and I have only seen each other one time since this started. We met at the at the African American History Museum in DC and ta- and spent the day walking around and talking about how we wanted to do this and how we wanted to structure it. And then the pandemic hit, 
and we have not been in each other's presence since then. And so just like him, I'm home with, I'm home with four kids. I have other projects that I'm working on. And on top of that, we're watching like utter chaos in our nation unfold. Right. Um, we're watching like profound, like transparently duplicitous leadership in our government. And we're watching people die on television. Like people are watching this and we're listening to despair and anger and resignation grow all around us. And we're watching polarization, victimization happen. And we're in the middle of all this. We're like, we are writing a book on reparations right now. Like <laughs> This happened right now. But when we started, I mean, when we started, people were hanging out together. You know, this was, he was, we we're all at Q conference thing. <laughs> and now I think we had this sense of, wow, this is, this is a thing to be doing this book at this moment in this mm -hmm. way. And, and I'm really deeply grateful for Duke's partnership and for his faithfulness and for his brilliance. And um, I learned a ton from him during this project. Um, and I felt like we were both able to really bring our full selves. And again, the book isn't perfect. We know that, but it is, as we said earlier, it's two brothers laboring in the hope of love and trusting that even with our frailties, this, this work is not wasted because we're, we're groping towards what we think the gospel is calling us to. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, again, I want to honor you guys for this work. I know that so many times there's ideas, but to actually have the stamina, to have the will to actually see it to fruition is a whole other ballgame. And so I applaud you guys for doing this. I thank you guys for paving this pathway for a lot of other folks like myself and, and others who see the need for this conversation. And you've saved us a lot of work um, because we can, we can really uh, reference a lot of the, the ground that you guys have laid. So thank you both for all that you do. How can our listeners learn more about each of you and obviously uh, this book that we've been chatting about? Well, I'm a pastor here in Washington, D.C., and if any of your listeners ever move to the District of Columbia, which often happens, you know, different jobs that people take or schools that they might attend, graduate schools, undergrad, would love to be in community with you all, especially as we endeavor in our church and in our wider church network to be, by God's grace, a cross-cultural community that's taking these particular cha challenges seriously as a priority in God's heart, not just an ancillary extracurricular kind of thing. And so... Yeah, would love to, to see people in flesh and blood if, if they do come this way. And, and if they already are in D.C., stay in your own churches. I'm not trying to steal you over. To our <laughs> but yeah, we're part of other conversations publicly, you know, whether on social media or different events that we're a part of. And so, yeah, maybe there's a way to, uh, to serve and, and bless you all that way, too. Yeah, so for my part, I keep a pretty low profile. A lot of folks don't even have any really idea who I am or what I'm doing, but you can follow the projects that I, I'm a part of. I'm leading an initiative called Voices Underground, and that's it. you can find that at buproject.org. And that is an attempt to promote African-American history and specifically the Underground Railroad in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and to build a national memorial to the Underground Railroad. That's that's the heart of my work. I'm also the creative director of a, of a new cocktail bar and restaurant that are centered in African-American history and culture, specifically in the history of African-American cocktail making um, and whose proceeds portion of those proceeds is being reinvested in minority owned businesses. That's called Star and Lantern. And our website will be up next month. It's starandlantern.com. And you can also follow us on socials under Star and Lantern, Star and Lantern. And, you know, obviously the reparations book is one part of a larger reparations ecosystem that we're committed to trying to see come into existence. And you can see that at the reparationsproject.com. But that Right now it's the book, but we're also producing a documentary film about reparations and we're in the midst of a capital raise for that right now. You, Like you mentioned earlier, you'll kind of see me showing up in different creative projects and then I'll sort of like disappear and then another creative project will emerge, you know, nine months or, or 18 months later. And that's sort of how I, how I tend to work. Uh, but you can, people can find me in, you know, in all those places. Did we mention the book website? reparationsproject.com yeah, yeah that, that's where people can find more info on the book and we're also trying to encourage people to consider purchasing the book from black owned independent bookstores nearby uh, so wherever you are and and uh wherever you live uh, to find a, a, a black establishment to support in the purchase of this book oh, that's great well, uh, if it's okay with you guys, I would love to just pray for you guys. I know this work uh, is not easy and I would love to do that. Please, thank you. 
Lord, thank you for Duke and for Gregory and for the labor of love that uh, they have been on uh, these last number of years. And I ask that you would bless them and their families. We know that this last year or so has not been easy for anybody, especially if you're writing a book on uh, such a immense topic and, and at times a heavy topic. That's not an easy thing to do. So I ask that spirit of God, you would refresh them, that you would provide for everything that they need, even for this capital raise, for their families, that uh, any sort of relationship that has happened over the last year that maybe they haven't been able to get as much attention to you as they would have liked. Lord, I ask that um, you would provide in, in the way that only you can to make the space for that. And thank you for these guys. And I ask that you would bless this work, that it would be read with the right heart and the right intentions, and that anybody that wants to use this for division, that you would just check their heart and that they would be sensitive to your spirit and uh, that we would all be open to your spirit's guidance on this topic. And we do ask that you would move this work forward and that you would have your way and, and that your church would look more beautiful as a result of this work. So thank you for Duke and for Gregory. And I speak your blessing on them in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Robert. Awesome. Great to get to connect with you guys. Hey, if you want to go to the National Museum of African American Music in Nashville, that's right around the corner from me. I've got passes, so just just holler. Awesome. All right. That sounds great. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much, Robert. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. All right. Take Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Should the church's mission include us repairing what's wrong in the world? After chatting with Duke and Greg, digging into their book, and spending my own time in prayer, study, and reflection, I believe the answer is yes. If you want to continue learning, growing, and discovering how to use your repentant imagination to repair the world around you, there are a few ways that you can do that. First, I would encourage you to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit about this. He is our helper and our counselor, and he knows what that next step is. There's no such thing as a small act of love, and I believe God's positioned you right where you are at this time in history for a purpose. Second, you can pick up this phenomenal book on reparations at bakerpublishinggroup.com. Lastly, you can visit praisehands.com slash get involved to join our private curated Facebook group. At that same link, that's praisehands.com slash get involved, you can make a donation to support this show, which enables our team to continue bringing you these incredible conversations. Well, guys, that is it for season five. I want to take this opportunity to personally thank you for listening, for sharing, and for being willing to examine this American intersection of church, race, music, and economics. On behalf of the entire Praise Hands team, thank you for being on this journey of creative cross-cultural Christianity with us. We'll see you in the fall for season six.